So as you can see, the presentation I'm going to give here is, is somewhat linked to one of the themes that uh, Orla was just talking about in terms of the cyber essentials theme. So one of the five aspects of that was the issue of patch management. I've referred to it around the issue of managing vulnerabilities here, but it very much links to the same sort of issue. And so what I'm going to be talking about in this presentation, setting the scene firstly on the problem of vulnerabilities. I'm sure several people in the audience have got some idea of this already, but to get us all on the, the same sort of page there. The importance of this requirement to patch systems and what can happen if we don't do that to a sufficient degree or in a timely manner. And then the challenge of doing so. So it's all very well to say that this is an important activity to undertake, but in some cases it's not actually that straightforward and there's some practical issues uh, that come to bear. And just to draw attention towards the end of it, around, well, the fact that some people aren't actually, well, not even very good at patching, very good at moving on past the dependence upon perhaps what is now legacy software, which is, well, patched to the nth degree already, and now even beyond its supportable life. So I've got a particular example which we'll use at that point, and then we'll have some conclusions. So just drawing on uh, the same source again that Orla used at the start of her presentation, the Information Security Breaches Survey, and uh, this is a quote from the, the current edition of it, and as you can see, it's referring immediately back to a problem that was already observed in last year's survey, and it wasn't exactly appearing for the first time in that context either, is the fact that many organisations don't appear to take the issue of patching as seriously as they should. And as a consequence of that, they are leaving themselves very vulnerable vulnerable to attack, uh, because this is one of the, the routes by which many attacks are actually able to be undertaken, either directly by attackers or via malware, etc. And in terms of what we mean by a vulnerability, here's a fairly widely cited one credited to Scott Culp from the uh, Microsoft Security Response Center. Now this one, if you Google it, you'll find uh, this requoted all over the place, so I thought it's a fairly good one to, to bring to your table today. So what we're talking about is a flaw in a product that makes it infeasible, even when you're using the product properly, using it correctly, to actually prevent an attacker from usurping privileges on the system, regulating its operation, compromising data, or assuming a level of ungranted trust. Okay, so that's the definition. How does this actually come to bear in practice? Well, there's several levels, actually. So vulnerabilities can creep in right at the outset in the design of something. So be that a bit of software, be it a protocol design, for example. So it can be there right from the word go. The next point at which something could happen is when the implementation occurs. So the, the actual specification, the design could be okay, but the way that it's actually been brought to practice in the implementation brings vulnerabilities in there. And finally, even if you've got something that's been well designed and well implemented, the way it's actually used, the way it's configured, the way it's set up, can still introduce an additional level of problem at that stage. And so as Operators of systems, as owners of systems, we need to be concerned with any of this, actually, and act responsively to things that are discovered that we then ultimately need to put right if they're not already correct on our systems. In terms of giving some sort of indication of the level to which uh, these issues occur, so these are reported vulnerabilities from, uh, well, taking from Checkpoint's 2013 security report. So I think that was released, if I'm right, earlier part of this year, reflecting last year. And as you can see, you've got a, a list of uh, major applications and, or vendors there, and uh, some significant numbers of reported vulnerabilities associated with them. So Oracle, they're way out in front, not necessarily a position that it would uh, wave a flag about being in, of course. But, you know, by no means alone in terms of there being vulnerabilities identified within the product base. In some cases, these are going to be vulnerabilities within the same products and successive things discovered. In other cases, it's going to be across a range of products that the, the vendor actually offers. But the consequence for anybody using this software is, okay, if something's been identified as a vulnerability, you need to do something about it, because at the point where the vulnerability is, 
well not necessarily identified, but at which a patch is released, that's when you often see a spike in the actual exploitation of the vulnerability because attackers then have got some software that directly shows what is going to change between the unpatched and the patched version and that gives a clue into reverse engineering the, the thing and actually then being able to develop exploit code that automates an attack. Okay, so across a range of platforms there are issues to answer there. So consequently, this issue of patching, of, of putting plasters over the problems that exist within the software, perhaps becomes one of the most common safeguards we actually need to encounter. So, so notwithstanding things like passwords, which we're regularly using and encountering security at the front door, but if we think about what else are we doing to maintain our security status, being asked to install updates, to patch our system, critical vulnerability updates, etc., these are things that I guess we face on a fairly regular basis. I hesitate to say daily, but certainly my systems tend to be offering me something as an update almost on a daily basis. It's not always security related, but at the end of the day, you're being asked to do something to stop what you're doing to install something, and you don't necessarily look to see what it is. It's that process again that's interrupting your activity. So just using Microsoft as an example then, this is by no means to sort of single them out as a major uh, cause of the problems, although they were in that previous list. Since the start of this year, there have been 42 security updates across the Microsoft product range that you would see if you go to their security uh, section of their website and look at uh, what's been released. So they're now batching them together on Patch Tuesdays and making sure that at least it's predictable and regulated release of the information and system administrators can consequently, in most cases, plan their activities accordingly. They know that the second Tuesday, I think it is, of every month, Microsoft are going to announce the latest round of updates. But nonetheless, it's a a fairly significant number of things and you can see that 22 of them are targeting Windows or relate to Windows um, installations and the others are spread across a variety of other Microsoft software so including things that are very common on end user systems such as Office and IE etc. So I'd say that highlights the point. This isn't just something for organizations. This is something for us as individuals as well, um, both in the context of our workplace, if we're using any kit that sort of ultimately falls to us to be taking care of it, if we think of bring your own device um, scenarios, for example, but also to organizations to make sure that the things within their network and that uh, have access to their systems are patched to a suitable level that they're not introducing a, a weak link in the chain. And I say, the, the, this issue of the unpatched systems facing increased risk goes back to that point that I mentioned about reverse engineering of patches once they become available. Actually, me just telling you there's a vulnerability in Internet Explorer, for example, might not give you anything you can directly do about it. But me giving you the patch, if you're technically oriented, will then let you see exactly what's changed between, I say, the patch and unpatched versions, and you might then be able to develop some code that takes advantage of it, because you've honed in basically on where that exploitability existed. I say this becomes hard to manage in some cases, particularly if we're thinking about users who are mobile in the sense that they're away from base, it's harder perhaps to track and manage their technology, again particularly if we're dealing in a bring your own device scenario, and also for users on non-broadband connections, and we'll see why that is in a minute, basically because of the volume of data that you need to download in order to actually install some of these patches. They're quite significantly sized if you're not on a sufficiently fast connection. And again, mobile users, mobile data links are not always of the, the sort of 4G or even 3G levels that you get within city environments like Plymouth. Um, if you're out in a more rural area and you're on the move, then your ability to do some of this stuff, and, and again, on a mobile device, you could still find yourself paying by the bite, um, and so your intention to download something that's gonna cost you a more significant amount of money or eat into your monthly data allowance you know, might make you think twice about it. So these sort of systems have the, the potential to remain unpatched for longer, and again, that can lead to vulnerabilities when they come into contact with other environments. Environments. So one thing that we've done sort of locally is ask the, the end user community, if you like, about their 
general practices when it comes to installing available updates. So this was, well, to date, this is based on 400 UK-based respondents, but we're also doing elements of this same survey um, in other regions. So we've got some results from South Africa, from the US, from Malaysia. We're seeking some from Australia and other parts of Europe, which I won't reflect here. But uh, we've got basically 290 respondents aged 18 and over they're the ones we might focus more upon and then some under 18s to show the the attitudes of what we could consider the emerging generation of it users so these were all um teenage users we weren't we weren't targeting really young um people there. So they were people who were using the technology and having the potential to encounter, for example, update messages. So let's look at the 18s and overs then. And we asked them basically what, what is their reaction when they see a message popping up on their system saying that there is an update available. So of course this could be on a desktop computer, could be on a mobile device, could be many scenarios that they get this. And uh, well, nobody here saying that they've never encountered such messages, so they were generally paying attention to the question they were being asked here. 9% say they generally ignore it, which is a little bit worrying. 25% um, do the thing that I suppose the textbook would tell you is a good thing to do, and immediately install the update. Some of them, another quarter basically, are saying, okay, we'll install it if it's indicated as being critical so that again gets them a tick in the box because perhaps the non-critical things you don't have to worry so much about anyway but then we've got 40 percent of people saying that they install the update at some point and the at some point of course might be after several days of declining to do it maybe even longer maybe they do it once a month or something like this because perhaps they've learned from experience that installing updates introduces a potential degree of inconvenience to them in terms of having to stop what they're doing restart the system etc so certainly the nine percent who generally ignore and those who install at some point if that point is fairly long away are increasing tangibly the vulnerability of that system if they're dealing with a security related update in these cases. So the under 18s, perhaps unsurprisingly um, given the, uh, the age, um, even greater potential to generally ignore and what that I suppose suggests okay we'll make an allowance for the fact they're younger but equally it doesn't seem to suggest that they're getting much awareness education in that this is a good idea that actually keeping systems up to date helps to protect them and that's something that perhaps they need to be concerned about so I uh, say some people in that case had, had not seen such messages but we're seeing here a uh, a greater proportion of what we could consider weak practice in the, the emerging generation. Another thing to bear in mind is, is why this is relevant in the context of attacks. Okay, so there are things like uh, David was talking about earlier today in terms of more targeted attacks towards big, big organizations, etc. But this quote, going back to a Sands Institute report from a decade ago now, still bears relevance. So that the vast majority of the successful cyber attacks out there, the, the things that uh, quite often hit the headlines, are going after a small number of or vulnerability in a small number of basically easy targets. And the fact is, as it says, attackers are opportunistic. They will go for the low-hanging fruit if the low-hanging fruit is there. And in many cases, that's enough. They, they get a wide population of targets, and that's good enough for them because it suits the nature of the exploitation they're looking to achieve. Okay, so this is, again, it's relevant to the context we're talking about because a wide base of unpatched systems gives this opportunity the, the vulnerabilities are known they're publicized exploits are available and they're usable so it doesn't even have to be that the attacker is actually the person originating the exploit code the exploit code is there in ready-made tools etc and so if your system is still vulnerable to those attacks the these these attackers will come and knock it Another um, sort of becoming dated, but it's still relevant to point out from Symantec back in 2009, the eight of the top 10 vulnerabilities noted in 2008 were considered to be medium severity. And uh, the exploitation of these was considered attractive for attackers because of course, high severity, 
high risk vulnerabilities will get patched quite quickly because people will take notice of that. There's a high risk, high, uh, high potential for exploitation, etc. Organizations, users even, might then respond quickly to deal with them. But these ones, where it's considered medium, people might not be so quick off the blocks. And so, consequently, they have the potential to be more attractive and exploited actually more. Okay? Another question that sort of arises, well, why do exploits persist anyway? And well, one of the reasons is, and this, this gets lessened now by the fact of more sales of software through app stores and electronic sources. But one is the continued distribution of software that straight out of the box, if you're still buying it that way, can be considered vulnerable. So if you go to a, a retailer on the high street and you take the software home and you install it, very often the first thing that you get confronted with is the fact that there are updates available and you know this new in often cases you bought it on the PC and you're going and plugging it in this new shiny object that you've bought wants you now not to sit and use it for the purpose you bought it for it would like to spend the next hour or so downloading and installing updates and getting you through a continual cycle of resetting the system which might not be to everybody's taste or indeed expectation and this, I say, this can persist for not just people buying new systems, but basically any software that you're buying in that context. I say in app stores, things of that nature, of course, the latest, most reliable, most up-to-date version can be sold um, to the latest customers. There's also potential ignorance of why patching is required in the first place. So again, in this audience, we would expect, I guess, a general acceptance and awareness of why, and we've had some coverage in several of the talks. But uh, I say, particularly for individuals, private users, there is an expectation with devices increasingly being sold as you know, basically commercial appliances that well, you should expect it to be able to work out of the box. You don't have this encounter when you buy a DVD player, a Blu-ray player, a television, a car or anything like that, that you, the first thing you have to do is a lot of maintenance on it. You expect it to work. Um, so this isn't sort of part of the, the purchaser culture um, enough yet. So people think, okay, this is something perhaps I can defer unless there's no opportunity not to. Consequence then that some vulnerabilities actually end up persisting on some systems for years, even though they're widely recognized, widely publicized, and fixes have been available. A very classic example is the remote data services vulnerability for Microsoft's Internet Information Server, as it was there. Um, so it was originally identified years and years ago, back in 1998. Um, and a patch was issued um, at that time in 98. It was then reissued the next year and reissued the year after that. But still, three years after that again, so five years after the, the vulnerability was originally identified, it was still prominent in SAM's top 20 list of vulnerabilities. Okay, so this is just evident or, or evidence of inaction by those who actually ought to be doing something about it. Okay, and it could come down to, despite Microsoft promoting the, the thing with security bulletins, etc., lack of sufficient awareness of this need to do so. Now, since then, things have been introduced within the operating systems and within applications more widely to do automatic updates. So it takes some of the burden away from users having to be explicitly aware that they should go looking to see if there's a bulletin that they need to, to act upon. But still, there are barriers to people even allowing the automatic updates to occur. And I say another thing that's, that's relevant to consider is the demands in terms of the, the data volumes, the amount that you need to download. And again, for a large organization with a large pipe, this doesn't necessarily matter so much. But if you're talking about smaller organizations still on limited connectivity, if you're dealing with mobile systems out in the wild there, here just as an illustration is that the size in gigabytes there of uh, Microsoft's monthly security update ISO images. So these are a one-stop shop for all the updates available that month as a, as a DVD image, basically. And you can see there, the average it sort of sits around two and a half gigabytes there as, as the average across most of the months there, some higher, some significantly lower. But you know, to download that volume of data, if you're dealing with, uh, I mean, you could have also got the, the updates individually over time here they're batched together um, but dealing with that amount of downloads on a not so fast link could be something off-putting okay 
And just as another uh, illustration, sort of the size in megabytes of some sort of standard updates um, that, that come available across a range of platforms and applications, so just giving a bit of a wider view of the situation. I say automatic updates, they're, they're with us now, they've been with us for some time. So of course this is very much a, an advancement, so to speak, in the likelihood of, of patches getting installed. So here we have the, the environment that you see within Windows 8, um, the latest version of Windows. This is the automatic update interface, and here um, the setting is to install updates automatically. It's the recommended setting, and that's what you would do. Okay, there are other settings that you can manually check and all the rest, or disable it altogether if you're determined to remain insecure. Um, but here's the, the default, the recommended one. But this still can introduce a level of overhead for the user. Um, and, it, and I'll illustrate that in a second. Equally, there, there's also the fact that the process, although it's headed here, um, auto-update, and this is on the, a Mac platform um, for Office, well, it's not being entirely automatic here because it's explicitly interrupting the user and asking them if they want to install something. There, there still has to be that user-focused decision about whether or not something is allowed to happen. Now, of course, there are other contexts, and they're equally sort of unwelcome for another reason, of where you, you come back to your system and find that it has actually installed the update without your explicit uh, permission to do so, and it's reset your system, and perhaps then the stuff that you were working on has disappeared. Um, so Windows has this habit of doing that overnight, and you come back to it, and Windows has restarted because of a critical update, and you think, okay, what was I doing before it did that? Operating systems are getting a bit better at retaining the context and putting things back where they were, but again, that wasn't the default position um, when the automatic updates started doing it. So. Here, just as a, as a little illustration of the, this issue of, I suppose, volume of, of downloads and overhead of the process, and this is through automatic updates. This is on a, a Windows 8 system that I'd not used for a, a good couple of months, and then came back to it um, thinking, okay, I need to do something on this system. But before I could do anything, of course, I'd left it for a couple of months um, not used, doubtless there were going to be some updates available. So uh, there were 25 important updates on this system straight from the point of switching it on, enabling it. So uh, yeah, needed to do those. Uh, 265 megabytes worth to download. And really, because they're important updates, I felt I couldn't actually get on with what I wanted to use the system for because you know, the, the system might be vulnerable, it needed to be patched, etc. After that, reboot the system. Um, there were more updates to be had, um, 20 more of them, and that was another 286 megabytes. So, okay, I'm a very patient person, as many people who know me would, would immediately describe me. So I thought, okay, let, let's, I'll have another coffee and we'll let this happen. Um, then there was another batch, um, two more updates, but actually the cumulative size even bigger than both of the previous sets put together. And so, okay, yeah, I'm fed up with coffee now, but I'll, I'll let that run also. And then just, just to sort of seal the deal, one more um, update, little one, um, but nonetheless. So four iterations of going through this process of finding updates for our own fault, if you like, for not having used the system for a couple of months and having used a Mac instead of Windows. It was Windows punishing me, quite clearly. Um, but nonetheless, quite a bit to do. And, okay, consequently, okay, if the system isn't well maintained, you face that sort of issue. To in total, almost a gigabyte and a half of data downloaded. So, okay, I was on a ASDL sort of broadband link, um, so I was getting a reasonable download speed, actually. Um, but it still took about 45 minutes and perhaps more notably three restarts before I was actually ready to use the system that I'd been ready 45 minutes earlier to actually do something productive with. So I'm giving a, a bit of an extreme example, but if, if users get the impression through an encounter like this, okay, it tells me there's some updates available, I'll install them, but I'm worried that there's going to be another round and another round. Perhaps this is the sort of thing that could motivate that behavior to say, actually, I'll leave this for another day because I've got something I actually want to get on with now. And so you can see how potentially these things get deferred and deferred until actually the system has perhaps been exploited in the meantime. 
Okay, so in terms of managing vulnerabilities, one issue, of course, is, is not to have them in the first place. And uh, I say Microsoft I've used as an example there a few times already, and it's worth noting that their practices have significantly advanced over the last decade or so compared to what you would have seen through the mid to late 90s, for example, with Windows 95 and 98, etc. And a lot of that goes back to this particular um, trustworthy computing email that Bill Gates at the time sent to staff across the company. And a key quote from it was as follows here, great features won't matter unless customers trust our software. So quite aware that Microsoft's name in relation to that wasn't exactly good at that time. So now when we face a choice between adding features and resolving security issues, we need to choose security. And what this was accompanied by was a greater level of training for the developers within Microsoft on secure coding practices. They actually suspended development activities for about a month after this email, so no new development. It was back to the, the, the boards with a code scrub to just go through and check as much as they could of the the existing software to try and resolve potential vulnerabilities. And so that has had an effect positively on Microsoft's level of well, non-vulnerable code being released. Now, of course, what it doesn't do, and it's never going to do, is completely solve the problem. But it can obviously help to reduce it. And so, uh, okay, I've mentioned the first few of those, those things already. But uh, just as an illustration of the effect of it, um, so versions of Windows from around that period, um, the number of critical or important security bulletins that got issued then within the first 320 days of their market life, there were 40 for Windows 2000 Server, which was prior to that initiative, compared to just nine for Server 2003. So a tangible difference perhaps as a result of those things above. So that's something obviously that we would expect our software vendors and developers to be doing much more natively now, so that, that there is this recognition of the, the exploitability of software, and so vendors ought to be doing it in an appropriate way, developing in the first place. So a question for you. Um, how many people still see this regularly on their computers when they start them up? Anybody willing to put their hands on one or two or three, people, four, a few more hands, some people sitting on them. Um, okay, so this, as you can see, is Windows XP, and as you may be aware, Windows XP reached its official end of life earlier this year. So back in April, Microsoft ceased support for Windows XP, and XP has been around for a while. It's had support for longer than Microsoft would have done it by default, so I think their typical or their standard uh, support lifetime is 10 years. Uh, they extended it a bit for XP because of the volume of people using it and depending upon it. Um, but there had to come a point where support stopped, was Microsoft's view. And XP, of course, over its lifetime has been host to a variety of, well, vulnerabilities and consequent um, exploitations. So here was their what you would have seen on their website back in September of last year. So very clearly making the point that uh, 8th of April this year, there won't be any more security updates, no fixes, no, no, no support for XP. Now what that didn't mean, of course, is there would be no more security vulnerabilities being discovered in XP. What it meant was Microsoft wouldn't be doing anything to fix them. The clear encouragement was people need to get off this platform and move to a more recent version of Windows. Okay, so basically if you went to Microsoft site on the day itself, um, support for Windows XP has ended and there is the zeroing of the counter. So what does it mean? Um, what, does, what does all this mean? So just after 12 years, so two years longer than they would normally have done it, um, they've ended support. It's very important that customers and partners migrate to a modern operating system such as Windows 3.1. Customers moving to that will benefit dramatically from a more secure, enhanced security environment, etc., etc. Get off XP and stop using it is the, the key message. Okay. It means you should take action. Um, so there will be no more support. People continuing to run XP will continue to run a vulnerable platform at greatly increased risk of being compromised because although the support stops, the development of attacks doesn't necessarily. So 
at the time of that original announcement on the website, what proportion of the population out there on the, on the net were using XP? Well, according to netmarketshare.com, and you can go to that site and have a look at what it says today, um, you can see there about a third of people, a third of the, at least the systems being encountered, were running Windows XP. Um, Windows 7, more popular, but XP is still having a very tangible position in the market. A month-ish ahead of the, uh, the discontinuation, things haven't changed all that much, okay? It's less than a third, but more than a quarter now. So uh, uh, Windows 7 has gained a bit more, Windows 8 has gained a bit more. On the day itself, so this is discontinuation day, um, yeah, so pe people are still using it to some degree, so all those messages about end of support, etc., haven't quite been heeded. So, okay, in the room we can congratulate ourselves that we only saw three or four hands. Um, if we did the population of the net, apparently, we would have seen a few more than that. Um, and start of this week. Um, still not changed dramatically then away from uh, a couple of months back. So XP is still out there. It's still being used. People haven't got off the platform. Um, and consequently, that means there's a lot of exploitable systems out there that could be exploited to the detriment of the owners, the users of those systems, but also to the detriment of other people, because of course if those systems get harnessed into botnets, etc., that can create problems for everybody else. Even if you've got a fully patched system, you can still be in receipt of the spam and the phishing messages and everything else that those botnets might be churning out. So, I say, the evidence suggests that even though you can wave a flag very significantly, people don't necessarily have that incentive to get off the platform. And why? Well, in many cases, I'm sure, because it actually still seems to be doing what they needed it to do. And if we think that many of the, the people that, uh, or, or whose systems were um, seen as part of this, this survey activity would be private individuals who you know, don't necessarily want to spend another £100 or whatever it is to upgrade to the latest version of Windows, perhaps they don't have the kit that's capable of speedily running the latest version or many reasons, or they just think, I've got a PC and it's doing what I want it to do. There are many reasons why people just won't feel the need to change. And so, okay, Microsoft has supported it for 12 years. The fact that there's still people using it perhaps suggests that in the, the, the support of the greater good, there may be maybe needed to be support for even longer. Is 12 years a period of time where we expect technologies to be totally abandoned? Have we been using the technology in and of itself long enough to really know what the useful lifespan of it is going to be? I say, the thing is that the vulnerabilities themselves actually continue. So it's not like Windows XP has been hardened to the point that nobody's going to do anything more to it. So looking at Secunia's uh, stats from earlier this year, okay, it's not the, the place where most vulnerabilities are being found, but it's given the other versions of Windows a run for their money. Um, and so that was across 2013, okay, uh, through the year, XP still quite getting a bit of quite attention there in terms of vulnerabilities being discovered. So they can be exploited, and of course now they won't be fixed. The difference in the other platforms is there will still be fixes being made available. Another thing is, um, it's, still, it's still there in terms of uh, quite a significant popular download. So uh, what that's highlighting, just in case you can't read it from a distance, and I need to bend into the screen to read it, is at number four in Microsoft's popular downloads. This was back in April, I grabbed this one, I will acknowledge. Um, Windows XP Service Pack 3. So at least people are patching XP to the best of their ability around the point at which it was about to be discontinued. But of course, that's not going to be much good as vulnerabilities continue to be discovered. Also notable, uh, just near the top of the list is Office 2003 Service Pack 3. Office 2003 also having had support discontinued for it around the same point. In fact, on the same day, I think. So Office, again, not exactly immune from exploitation and clearly sufficient people still using it to be getting the latest Service Pack for it and putting it almost at the very top of the download list. So some points in conclusion then. So I guess 
we've established that the vulnerabilities are a, a problem. They are a growing problem insofar as there are more systems out there running software that needs this sort of attention. Um, and in addressing the, the publicized vulnerabilities, or delay in addressing it rather, increases the potential for exploitation by the attackers. There isn't an easy solution because you know, for all the, the suggestion that we've got to be quick to patch, we know also that there are potential problems in terms of being the first to patch your system. In some cases there are you know, clear experiences of the patch itself not being quite ready for deployment, introducing instability, introducing incompatibility with other software that people are running. So uh, more experienced administrators, for example, might say, OK, let's just wait a little bit to see if actually people who rush to do this report any problems as a result. And there was uh, Windows XP Service Pack in the past, and I think Service Pack 2 um, managed to create quite a lot of incompatibilities, including with internet security software. Um, developers are certainly improving the situation, but it's never going to remove the need to keep our eye on this ball. So this is something that we've got to live with as a consequence of using the technology. And moreover, we're having to live with it in an increasing range of contexts. So I say, you've got traditional desktop devices, laptop devices, tablets, smartphones, home video game consoles, all of these things now are all connected, they all have things that need updating on them. And for everyone using it, it is that decision about, am I prepared to accept that overhead of letting it do this and delay me doing what I wanted to do when I sat down in front of it. Okay, so it does need a culture change amongst the users. So in terms of where possible, tolerating the need to do the updating regularly, but also the acceptance that products do reach an end of life, apparently, while they are actually still visibly, to you and I, seeming to do the job we actually purchase them for. And so that, again, if we're going to succeed in securing the wider environment, that needs to be taken on board, and that incurs a cost as well. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, and enjoy your lunch.